The Red Sewing, a David Hancock and Laurie Perister directed episode of House of the Dragon, airs this week and serves as the penultimate installment of season 2. Of course, one might assume that the growing rivalry between the Blacks, under Queen Renera Targaryen, and the Greens, under Prince Eamon Targaryen, as his brother King Aegon II recuperates from the Battle of Rook's Rest, would be nearing a fever pitch. Even though the second season is still missing one episode, this week's introduces one of the most important moments in the Dance of the Dragons, and ends with Renera announcing to her adversaries how much actual firepower she now possesses, but let's go back and remember what transpired in the last few seconds of the previous week's episode, well. Accepting Renera's kiss with Miseria, her new advisor. Sir Stefan Darklin, her Lord Commander, attempted and failed to convince Seasmoke to accept a new rider, when Seasmoke swooped over Driftmark and announced his intentions with Adam of Hull, one of Corlys Valerion's bastard sons, Renera realized that she was at her wit's end. Does this scenario alter our understanding of who gets to sit atop a dragon? Perhaps, but it appears that Adam won't be the only lowborn who is tested, especially since there are still two more dragons out there in need of riders, three, if you count that wild one flying around the Vale, in King's Landing, Alicent, Olivia Cook, is recovering from the wound she sustained during the riot outside the Sept in last week's episode. It seems she will now also bear a scar on her arm in a very similar position to the one Renera sustained during their tussle back in Season 1. The Dowager Queen is in a state of self-reflection this week, reconsidering her place not only within this overall war but in the city itself. Even the Red Keep seems to be falling into disrepair, with rats running around freely, but that's to be expected after Aegon had all the ratcatchers murdered. Back in Episode 2. It seems as though what Alicent is really seeking is a change of scenery, and she taps a member of the Kingsguard, Sir Ricard Thorne, Vincent Reagan, to accompany her to the Kingswood, no retinue, no handmaidens, just him as her escort. Sir Ricard looks understandably concerned by this idea, given that public sentiment hardly lies with the royal family at the moment, but he also can't refuse the Dowager Queen either, Alicent taking a mental health day, camping and swimming in the Kingswood, may be laden with Ophelia imagery, but it also couldn't have come at a better time given what's happening back in the city. As punishment for helping to start that riot at the Sept. All of Aegon's friends who the king unwisely promoted to White Cloaks are being stripped of that honor and sent to the Wall, courtesy of Eamon. As Master of Whisperers Larry Strong, Matthew Needham, and his fellow small council member Jasper Wilde, Paul Kennedy, oversee the proceedings, the Master of Laws privately admits to Laris that he has heard rumor of the Dragon Sea Smoke bearing a new rider. Admittedly, the identity of said rider is currently unknown, and when Laris inquires about where this intelligence came from, Lord Wilde confesses he happened to hear it third or fourth hand, his squire, who heard it from a stable hand, who heard it from his father, who heard it from his shipmate. It seems Laris prefers to get his gossip closer to the source, however, as he points out that Lord Wilde is welcome to bring this information to Eamon, but adds that maybe it would be best to leave this particular whisper to the wind. Little do either of them know, however, that said rumor is actually rooted in a truth that won't be discovered until it's too late, Aegon's physical treatment sessions with Grand Maester Orwile have begun inside the Red Keep, but the king is having difficulty walking even with the use of a cane that is hardly strong enough to support his weight. The pair uses their combined might to bring the king back into bed when Laris interrupts them and chastises Orwile for trying the rehabilitation effort alone. Aegon is obviously beginning to recover from the worst of his burns, but he is now without an ear and obviously still in a great deal of pain from his fractured bones. Despite this, Laris informs Orwell that Aegon must be up and moving around in a few hours. Aegon may never be able to move the same way he once did, but he needs to be forced to fortify himself. With so many threats constantly hanging over him, Laris subtly warns Orwell that it might be some time before he can fully relax again, as anticlimactic as one could anticipate. Given that the Queen's newest dragon rider is already on her side, is the initial encounter between Renera and Adam that opens the episode. Aside from their riders standing nervously at a distance, it's actually amusing to watch Sea Smoke, Adam's new dragon, and Syrax, Renera's dragon, periodically growl and snarl at each other. 
During a scene, Sirax bellows loudly to keep Adam away, but Sea Smoke also draws closer to his rider when Renera approaches her kneeling victim, shouting clearly in defense of him. In response to Renner's question concerning Adam's lineage, the shipwright remains silent regarding his relationship with Corlys, merely stating that he was born to no one of consequence. Adam has accomplished the unthinkable in Renner's eyes, and the smile that spreads across her countenance appears to be connected to her belief that the conflict is starting to move in her favor, Prince Jacarys Valerion, Harry Collett who expresses strong dissatisfaction of the current course of events but holds back his true views until he has a private session with his mother, is less than delighted about this development. There, the truth comes out, and it's more deeply rooted in Jace's own feelings about his legitimacy as heir. The subject of Renner's three children with the late Sir Harwin Strong, Ryan Sorar, was a major source of controversy in season one, a wild topic of speculation for her naysayers but vehemently opposed by her father, King Viserys, Paddy Considine, even though the evidence of the boy's true parentage was too obvious to ignore. As Jace posits, though, if anyone can ride a dragon, regardless of their status, what will happen if one of them decides to challenge the line of succession and sit on the Iron Throne? The fact that both Corlys and Adam are being deliberately obtuse about their blood connection. However, is part of what makes the situation worse, especially since we know that Jace doesn't have all the puzzle pieces that we do about why Adam might have been chosen, Miseria is the one who sows the seed to investigate the number of Targaryen bastards in Dragonstone or King's Landing, regardless of Jace's opinions regarding who gets to be a dragon rider. Princelings, misbegotten children whom no one would question, have spawned several generations of illegitimate children. Though Renera finds it hard to understand, Miseria points out that she might be able to win her closest allies among the lowborn, after all, aren't her half-brothers, who are also pure Targaryens, the ones who are presently fighting against her claim to the throne. Renera recognizes the irony of this search immediately, having lived through years of hearing disparaging remarks directed at her own sons because of their heritage. She's not above building an army of bastards at this point in order to win this battle, in her own words, a meeting has been arranged between Demon, Matt Smith, and Oscar Tully, Archie Barnes, the newly appointed Lord Paramount of the Riverlands following the passing of his grandfather. But when he and Demon face off this time, it's clear that Oscar is already very different from the green, wide-eyed innocent that the King Consort originally encountered earlier in the season. This week, Demon has no options because, as Oscar notes, he's made a mess of everything. Oscar has some requirements before he agrees to work with him, but he knows he needs the help of House Tully and all the River Lords who have vowed loyalty to their Lord Paramount in order to strengthen his forces. Privately, Demon attempts to force the young Lord Tully to demonstrate his allegiance, but when they are in front of the other River Lords, Oscar declares that his family will uphold the pledge they made to Viserys and Renner. His legitimate successor. That promise won't be abandoned by him, even if Demon is a particularly loathsome representative. However, a punishment for House Blackwood's terrifying war tactics against House Bracken must be exacted before the Lord Paramount turns over the vast army of the Riverlands. Demon is tasked with condemning those crimes and personally administering justice, it's unclear if Demon will stick to playing nice with his new allies or find a different way to screw things up when the Riverlords testify that he has Sir Willem Blackwood's head. Renera knows that the best way to find potential dragon riders is to go directly to the source. That's why she sends boats to King's Landing, where they are escorted by armed sailors and operate in the dark, in order to gather up any Targaryen blood that may exist. At the appointed hour, roughly fifty men and women show up on the shore to be brought to Dragonstone. Miseria's devoted lady-in-waiting, Alinda, Jordan Stevens, who stays hidden in the city, has already been hard at work spreading the news at her direction. Ulf the White and blacksmith Hugh the Hammer, Kieran Boo, who sees this possible dragon claiming as a last-ditch attempt following the death of his sick daughter, are among them who we already know is the bastard half-brother of Viserys and Demon based on his own claims in various taverns around the city, given how much time the season has already spent building up these two characters, it seems fairly obvious who will see survive to claim a dragon and who will end up being devoured, burned to a crisp, or both. 
That said, it does seem important for Renera to address the group en masse before they descend into the caverns of the Dragonmont where the unclaimed dragons sleep, asserting that their lives will be forever transformed from this moment, either by the honorable sacrifice of death or by the link between dragon and rider. Her decision to bring bastards to Dragonstone. However, doesn't sit well with the Valyrian dragon keepers, all of whom walk out in protest rather than participate in the ceremony, the first dragon available to be claimed, Vermuther, who we've met before, back in season 1 when Demon first sang to him, is also known as the Bronze Fury, and it's a fairly apropos name given what transpires. Those who are familiar with the Beats of Fire Blood will know that this event ultimately goes down in history as the Red Sowing or the Sowing of the Seeds, many men and women step forward to potentially earn the right to become a dragon rider, and many of them lose their lives in the process. Amid fiery destruction, terror, and bloodshed, Ulf is knocked off the platform into the caverns. And Hugh ultimately finds himself face to face with Vermuther, screaming at the dragon to simply finish him off already. It turns out, though, that all the big, bronze dragon apparently needed was somebody to match his freak, and Hugh's energy is the exact kind of bold fearlessness in the face of death that leads to him bonding with Vermuther. Meanwhile, Ulf stumbles around the caves beneath Dragonstone, searching for a way out, when he encounters a sleeping Silverwing. The dragon wakes up when he accidentally steps on a clutch of eggs, but instead of killing him where he stands, she playfully knocks him down a few times with her snout, the next time we see Ulf, he's riding Silverwing over King's Landing and clinging to the saddle for dear life. The little council and Emond are eventually alerted to the street cries, and when they see a dragon circling overhead, the prince regent rides out to the neighboring field where Vagar is soundly resting and takes to the sky himself. What at first looks like a simple target for an inexperienced dragon rider, however, turns out to be a trap prepared for Eamon and a show of power, as the prince approaches Dragonstone, he notices that Renera's seat is nearly crawling with dragons now, Silverwing, Syrax, and Vermuther, among others. Not to mention Moondancer and Vermax, all of them bear new riders. Although Rena, Phoebe Campbell, has braved the perilous cliffs of the Vale in an attempt to claim her own dragon, Carax's may still be a major question mark, and Renera is now significantly stronger in terms of sheer numbers. All the same, it's hard to ignore what the Dragon Keeper said to the Queen this week, how many more dragons will end up as, playthings for the games of men, killed in the sake of a war that was essentially beneath them in the first place. That concludes subjects, unlock the mysteries of narrative with our YouTube channel's guide to the art of cinema. Join us as we explore the plots, characters, and pure enchantment that movies bring into our lives. From writing to screen, we have you covered. Join us as we examine, evaluate, and celebrate the magic of movies. For more videos, subscribe to our channel.